Welcome back, shalligators. Welcome back not only to Vlogmas, welcome the fuck back to lockdown, right? <laughs> oh my god. Ah! Really? Again, we're doing this again? You guys, today, we're gonna take a break from talking about celebrity stuff and we're gonna talk about things that matter a little bit more, us, because a lot of places around America, perhaps even the globe, honestly, it's too stressful for me to even check, it makes me too mad, are going back into lockdown, right? Back into quarantine, lockdown, curfew, whatever the fuck it's manifesting as, the thing that we thought we were tapering off of, the hellscape that seemed to be sort of dissipating, seems to be right back. How are we going to deal with this? How can we stay positive and productive and have a better experience than maybe we did in March? I've got some ideas. I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna break it all down. We really are in this together. And I don't mean that in the way that like, you know, JetBlue says we're in this together. Really? Because when my bag was two pounds overweight, I was on my own, so you can go fuck yourself. But before we do, just want to remind you guys, if you have a love question, you want to connect with me one-on-one, -on -one, there's two ways. You can head on over to Cameo if you want a video shout out for me, birthdays, pep talks, love questions, anything like that. Or you can go to shallonlester.com and submit a longer written question to me over there. And while you're at shallonlester.com, go ahead and shop my new merch collection. We've got some warm-blooded jogger sets. We have a revenge hoodie and t-shirt, also with a sticker that you can buy. We have a super fun, ugly sweater. I'll be home for Christmas, because we are gonna be home for Christmas, but we can still be home for Christmas. So head on over there and shop. Also, please consider donating while you're on my website to the Shalanthropy fundraiser we're doing this holiday season, raising money for gifts, warm coats, and presents for kids and seniors at the Gethsemane Garden Baptist Church. Baptist Church, it's a black Baptist church in the Lower East Side of New York City. Most of the residents, well, all, almost everyone at that church lives below the poverty line. So we are halfway to our goal of $2,000, which is really going to be a game changer for everybody there. We can do it. We can also, we can get through this. Okay. All right. So, so if you don't know, if you live someplace, I don't know, organized, insane, <laughs> aka not America right now, <clears throat> you might not be going back into a second round of lockdowns. America is, specifically California. California just ordered their, I don't know if it's shelter in place, but small businesses are shutting down. Um, all like food is no longer dine in. You can only do takeout. Retail is like open at some sort of capacity. And there's a lot of feeling about this. I'm not a Californian anymore. I mean, you know, in my heart, but like I, residency wise, obviously I live in Montana. And by the way, our governor has like jack shit to say to us. He, we haven't heard from that motherfucker in like two months. I think he, Steve Bullock, he lost the uh, the Senate race to Steve Daines, who's a, who's a dick. I voted for Bullock. And I feel like Bullock's just like, bye, you're on your own. Like he hasn't said anything. And our cases are bad here. You know, it's like, it's like COVID has finally hit Montana. I feel like we are where the rest of the country was in July. Um, I was saying that like Aruba, where I just was, has a population of 110,000, whole country, whole island. The county I live in, Gallatin County, has the same population and we have about 6,000 cases. And those are just the cases that are being recorded. One of my friends got COVID like bad, like it was so obvious she had it. Test came back inconclusive. She's the fourth person I know who had an inconclusive test. And my other friend, <clears throat> um, hi, Miss Jackie, if you're watching, her doctor was like, don't even bother getting tested, just assume you have it. And this is like what so many people are hearing, like, don't even bother, we're so backed up on tests, just assume you have it. So it's like the numbers that are being reported are probably like way lower than what's actually happening. Don't worry about us, Bullock, we got it. But then I'm like, I don't know what I'm complaining about because I can still go out to eat, I can still do things, like, great, you know? <sighs> Okay, I'm following the laws. You know, we're all wearing masks and stuff and things are at limited capacity. But so some of my friends live in California and the atmosphere is really different this time around. And and they, they're the first to say that. They're like, there is a palpable anger in the air. This isn't, we're in this together, flatten the curve. We're, just, we're doing our part. It's like World War II. It's like, who the fuck are you, Newsom? They're calling him Newsolini. Because it just seems 
from from what they say that there's a lot of like corruption like oh you're gonna make these small businesses these nail salons or whatever shut down but yet you're approving mo movies to still be going forward because that makes tax revenue for the counties and for the state people are mad people are mad and they're like i don't think we should have to fucking do this like i don't if the sick you know, if there's weak and vulnerable people with comorbidity, they need to self-select and stay home and let the rest of us get back to our lives. Our economy is crumbling. And where is the help for the people whose businesses close down? And then in a month, they're going to be homeless and they're going to lose their insurance. Where's all the help for them? Why are we only focusing on people who are affected by this disease when poverty is its own sort of death sentence? This, These are the opinions I'm hearing. And like those opinions are valid. But then it's like, well, what? we can't just let people get sick and die. But we let people get sick and die of other things. It's just, it's like this, this snake eating its own tail. Like, and that's what's so frustrating, I think, for all of us about this pandemic is there doesn't seem to be one right answer. No matter which path we take, there is a huge toll. Whether that toll is more immediate or it might take a few months to manifest. We don't know yet. One thing we do know is that if we did it once, we can do it again. I know. Why should we have to? I get it, I get it. But it's like I've been saying about this, this shit is happening. This shit is underway. We can't escape it. Most of us can't escape it. You know, we don't have the luxury of absconding to Aruba or Taiwan or wherever things might be better. We are just gonna have to ride it out with the American fortitude that exemplifies our great nation. At least it did it one time and we got to get it back. So I was thinking about it because <clears throat> I was trying, you know, I'm, I'm a silver liner. I tried to find, <laughs> and a shower liner, I'm trying to find like the silver lining for this. And I think what was hard about the first lockdown is we there was no sense of what was going to happen. We were hoarding toilet paper. <laughs> Still doesn't make any sense. It's not a gastrointestinal disease. Hoard Kleenex. You might be coughing and snotting. Okay. <clears throat> we didn't know how long it was going to go on. We didn't know if this was going to sweep through our cities and kill everyone. We didn't know if it was going to, like, leave this city just a waste. We didn't know anything. Now we kind of do. We have so much more data on how many people recover from this, about the people who get sick, what comorbidity factors contribute to really bad outcomes. I mean, it's still such a roll of the dice, though, which is so scary. One of my friends, she's literally a triathlete um, and her boyfriend is fairly out of shape. <laughs> but she he got it. They live together. He was like he got it. it was like fine. It was a little cold. She had a temperature of 104, 105. Like that's brain damage territory. And she just got annihilated. And you're like, of all the people, she's so healthy. Like, that's crazy. Anyway. This go around, we have more data, not just about the disease itself, but about how we as humans did in quarantine, what was bad about it, and what was good about it. Because yes, there were some things, if we challenge ourselves to find them, that were positive. No FOMO, right? We maybe weren't out spending and eating and drinking as much as we were. We might have been at home doing it. Maybe we didn't have to have contact with people, like have that bullshit conversation around the water cooler at work that actually like made you so anxious now that you get away from it. Maybe you don't have a commute anymore and you're working from home and you're like, wow, this is kind of nice. And I know it's in our nature to be like, okay, no, I don't have a commute, but I also don't get out of my pajamas and I'm home with my kids and my boyfriend and my parents and my dog and I want to pull my hair out because I don't have an escape. I know that. I'm not saying that the positives don't come with the negatives. I'm saying that we have to choose to focus on those positives as much as we possibly can just to get us through these moments of like, <gasps> of just existential crisis. I'm a big believer in lists. You know I love a good list, girl. I love a writing something down with a bunch of different colored markers. I love it. The other day, I made a list of all the things I loved and hated about Quarantine. I was quarantined at home with my family, with my mom in Southern California. It's before my little cowboy was even born. He was just a glimmer in his mama's eye. And I wrote down what I could and couldn't stand. I really liked 
being outdoors as much as I was. I was in Southern California. I was in a warm environment. I could go for walks around the block. I could sit in the backyard. You know, we had the inflatable pool. My best friend quarantined with us for several weeks. So like that, that was great. I liked that I was controlling, purely in control of my diet. There was no FOMO. I wasn't out, oh, should we get wine? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's what led me to the drinking challenge and why I felt the need to do that drinking challenge where I stopped drinking for a while because I had been in quarantine for so long, getting back into the real world where suddenly this FOMO thing and these peer pressure situations were back in my face. I was not prepared for it. And I realized how much I enjoyed having no other option. I mean, you can drink at home. I've just never been a big home drinker. It's just not, I don't know, it's not my thing. I'm like very much social. But that. But I learned that. I learned that about myself that, hey, left to my own devices at the house. Like, I mean, maybe I'll have a glass of wine, but like, that's, that's it. I don't know really that. But there were things I didn't like. I didn't like not having my own space. I was at my mom's house, you know, and I know that's huge for you guys. I really didn't like not getting laid. I mean, mm, I'm a red-blooded American girl, honey. I got needs and I got skills. I should be having a lot of sex because I'm good at it. So that was difficult. And so I'm like, okay, I'm adding up these data points. We got the constellation because, you know, when we were coming out of quarantine, I think a lot of us were like, if I had to do this again, how would I do it differently? And I remember thinking, if, if we have to go into another lockdown, would I go back and stay with my mom? Like, now that I have my own place, I'm not in New York, I have the dog. And I was like, yeah. Mm, well, no, I don't know about that. I don't know. I mean, it was, I honestly had a great time with her. Like, and it, it, there's ups and downs for sure. But overall, like, I have a really good relationship with my mom. So I was lucky that, you know, I was out there with her. But I think now it's like, okay, I've taken that constellation of data points. And I'm like, that adds up to, I could be in my house. I could stay here. Maybe the boyfriend, if he's quarantining his and what, you know, like could do, do the thing. He could quarantine with me. Like, so I've got at least data. I've got data points. And that helps cut down this existential righteous mania about what the fuck is going to happen. What is going to happen? Humans? Not very good at chaos. Psychologists even have a scale. They call it the chaos tolerance scale. I actually have an extremely high chaos tolerance. I think it's because I just have traveled so much and traveling, you got to be real good with chaos. You got to roll with the punches. You're kidnapped in Africa. Okay. You get bit by a tarantula in the Amazon. That's fine. You have surgery without anesthesia in Belize. Whoops. All of these things happened. <laughs> uh, I got bit by a shark. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll do a whole story on my travel adventures because they are wild. They're wild. I think that's why I like to travel now and like lay on a beach because I'm like, I've done it. Okay, I've I've done my tour of duty in like adventure travel. I've climbed an Egyptian pyramid. I've had a man try to buy me for his son. I just want a Mai Tai. Thanks. But some people have an extremely low chaos tolerance, you know, and that's valid. But I think none of us have a high tolerance for not knowing if we're going to live or die not having freedom of movement, and not having choice. I said before in other videos, choice, freedom, liberty, this is America, baby. This is all we got. So when you take that away from us, it really, it strikes at the heart of truly who we are as Americans. Like this is part of our identity. This is part of our patriotism. This is why the fuck we pay so much in taxes. It is, you know? And so for this to be taken away, we, it's like, we start to question everything about our life here. Why do we live here? Where else could we possibly go? Other countries, it's like, oh, well, you know, if you live in maybe a more developing country, it's like, well, it sucks here, but I could go here, 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 and that would be better. We as Americans, truly, we were raised to believe that like, there is no better country. There's like countries that are cool in their own way. Germany's cool, Switzerland's cool, but they're not America. And then we have to look at this fuck show here in America and we're like, oh my God, we are a mess. And it has never crossed our mind to live anywhere else. And that is, that is America, but that's also very much New York, you know, and 
you guys know I moved from New York and so many of my friends are still there and I just want to like shake them and I'm like why are you still here and it's because it's like the Stockholm syndrome like you just you're like but where else is there to go where would we ever go that's better and as an outsider I can look at New York and I'm like literally anywhere my friend found a cup of human feces <laughs> the street like the other day my other friend had a bum masturbating in front of her. My other friend saw a dude shoot up on the subway. Like, where else can you go? Guantanamo Bay comes to mind. Seems to be more order and structure there. But I know that you guys outside of America are saying the same things about us. It's like, why are you guys still there? I mean, don't come here. Don't come to our country. But like, get it the fuck together. So we're going through a lot over here in America. Okay, we really don't need to be shit on anymore. We, I feel like this is just a lot of karma um, crashing down wave after wave after wave. So thanks. And my friend Julie and I were talking the other day. She has a great podcast about postpartum life called Do Tell Mama. Go check it out. She's awesome. She's a former New York girl just like me. Now she's in SoCal. And she was saying, you know, we all sort of expected this fog to lift after Trump lost. And if you guys still think he's going to win... Oh, he will win one state, state of denial. That's about it. She's like, you know, I felt like my body relaxed for the first time in four years after election night. And I felt like I've been in an abusive relationship. And I was like, oh, I completely understand. And she's like, but I just don't feel, I don't feel like better yet. And I'm like, well, that's because life doesn't seem to be getting better. It seems to be getting worse. And we, we removed the main contagion, the man who made it so awful and made this whole disease such a shit show. Don't even get me fucking started. Well, I have gotten started. Anyway. And so it's like, wait a minute. We have a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, we feel like it. But then, like, that light is dimming. And now we're in lockdown again. It's really hard. And I know. I know. So I want you guys to think about the things that made you unhappy last time. And maybe your circumstances haven't changed. I'm lucky enough that I do have the option of being with my mom or being here or being with Vince or being wherever. Thanks to my job and stuff. But I, I get that that is not everyone's situation and I I have my own feelings about this secondary lockdown and that really fuels a lot of it is I understand that this is not okay for so many people for even if they're not business owners or whatever it's like emotionally the emotional toll this is taking on people is a health toll as well and I feel like that should be considered and maybe it is I don't know I don't know I'm not a politician this is why I don't have to make these decisions, fuck. But I want you to look at the things that drove you really crazy. You know, and you're probably like, my parents. It was my parents that drove me crazy? It was them. Okay, well, you can't maybe get away from them. But look at the trigger points. When did you fight the most? Were they nagging you about keeping your room clean? Girl, maybe just keep your room clean then. I mean, what's the downside, you know? Were they lecturing you about politics? Okay. When did they start lecturing about politics? After dad had a few beers? After mom was watching Fox News or whatever? Maybe that's the time you go for your walk at night. Maybe that's the time you're like, hey, I've signed up for some like online courses. I'm doing some online workouts. I'm gonna be up in my room, my clean room, and that's when I'm gonna be doing these things. Usually, you would be shocked at how many quarrels and tensions are solved by a simple schedule change. You really would be. Worst case, try it. Because at the very least, again, it comes back to control. And it comes back to data and feeling like you know what's going to happen. Okay, I have I have worked out the data about when dad flips out, when mom is at her absolute craziest, when my sister is at her bitchy 13 year oldiest. I've like literally made a map, maybe a schedule. I'm gonna be busy then, I'm gonna be out of the house then, I'm gonna be taking a shower then, boom. You feel like you have some control. It might not work every time, but at least you have some sort of a plan. And again, the hard thing about this lockdown is not feeling like you have any control and not feeling like you can even make a plan about anything. I said in my in stream video, I have an in stream video going up uh, bright and early tomorrow, but I talk about my trepidation about going back to New York City and how I've been like vexed that my friends and I have not been able to plan a trip out of town, like for some birthdays that we have coming up. And it's like the fact that we don't know what our schedule, what our life, what America, what what any of this is going to be like 
not even eight months from now, four weeks from now, it just, it makes you want to pull your hair out and it just makes you so power hungry for any sort of control in your life. And we can get that on the micro, even if we can't get it on the macro right now, right? That's okay. (laughs) One of my friends said this to me and I was like, do you know you're not making me feel better? She's like, think about it. We, control actually is usually just an illusion. Like we think we have control over things pre-pandemic. It's like, oh, like everything's fine. I know where the country's going to be in six months. That's never been true. That's never been true. Like, what? I was like, yeah, that that's true. And it's horrifying. So I guess sort of let go of the idea that we have to be able to control our future. You know what I mean? The next few weeks, next few months, we might not know the duration of this lockdown, but we can kind of figure out the contents of it because we've been through it. We know, okay, I'm going to be annoyed about this. I'm going to enjoy that. So I'm going to amplify that. I'm going to think about it more and try to make that a larger part of my lockdown. And that's going to give me some sense of control and data. I also want you to make another list because we made one about what we loved, one about what we hated. This is what do you wish you could have done differently in that lockdown? And I said this during the quarantine videos that I did um, back in March and during it. It's like, someday this is going to end. And maybe five years from now, maybe five months from now, you might look back and be like, I wish I'd taken that time to X, Y, and Z. Do Pilates every day. Read a book every two weeks. Finally apply to law school. Start that Etsy t-shirt company. Spend more time with my grandmother. Really clean my room and clean out my closets. There was something. There was something. So now this is the second chance. And like I said, we might not be able to change this. And rallying against it and getting super pissy and bitter doesn't always change the outcome, right? So we got to switch gears and figure out, okay, if this is happening and this is just what it is, how can I roll with this? And how can I use this to my advantage? How can I use this setback as a setup? We talk about that all the time. Setbacks and setups. That guy didn't dump you. He emancipated you. If he dumped you, that was a, probably a bad relationship anyway. You weren't happy. Now you're free to go find something that did make you happy. That job that fired you, not a setback, a setup. Now you can go someplace you're actually valued. Something that pings up all that self-actualization. This lockdown, setback, yeah, in a lot of ways, of course. But also the chance for some setups. I wished I'd worked out more. I mean, I lost weight. I lost like seven or eight pounds, gained it back. But now I'm like, okay, hey, if we go into a lockdown, no more riding around, going to bars, drinking White Claws and Bud Lights and all this shit. Nope, you're home. I bought the mirror, the workout system. You're doing your mirror twice a day. They're like 30 minutes. It's not hard to do two a days. You're doing that. You're outlining your two new books. You're doing this. Like, of course, I don't want that to happen. But I have already decided on the silver linings. Man, I could just work all day. I don't have to worry about FOMO and this and that. And ah, hibernation happens for a reason, you know? And I've been thinking a lot about hibernation because it's about to get real hibernating here in Montana. The snow's coming and it lasts for like four months. And I'm like, okay, how can I use this to my advantage? What are the upsides about this? Because seasons come and they go and we don't control the seasons. And this pandemic is a season, but in a season of the earth, People always find something wonderful. They ski, they windsurf, they pick leads, they got a fucking pumpkin patch, whatever it is. Because we know that it's temporary. So we're like, you know what? I'm just going to lean in. I'm going to not fight it. I'm not going to bitch that it's winter. I'm going to learn to ski. So I hope this has been sort of helpful for you guys. I know that this is a really, really tough time. And I would, we would all just love to know when it's going to end, but we, we don't have that luxury. But to, To go through something like this in a way is a gift. The resilience that we are going to come out of this with, if we want, we can come out bitter as fuck. And plenty of people have. Plenty of people have come out neurotic, bitter, hostile, fearful. That's not us. That's not us. We might feel that in blips and spurts. Okay, we're we're humans. But that's not who we are. We know how to snap out of that mindset and be like, no, we're reorienting from bitter to better. That's what we're doing. 
I want to know what you guys have to say about this. How are Corona things going in your area? Do you think you're heading towards a lockdown? Are things like pretty much better? Do you feel kind of like you're out of the woods? I hope it's the latter and not the former. But you know what? We really are in this together. And I mean the Chalantourage. All of us from around the world. We can do this. Check back tomorrow for more Vlogmas. And like I said, yeah, I'm going to be going to New York. So we're going to be... I have to. I like haven't... Watch the Instagram video. I went in this whole spiral. But I'm going to be doing some videos on how to make it in the big city. How to know if the big city's right for you. And how to know when to be in the big city. I'll see you later, Shadligators. Bye.